The first set in the Mirrodin block, the set Mirrodin, came out on October 2nd, 2003. It is the 30th expansion in the game's history, and sees the game move from its Dominaria-centric story to the plane of Mirrodin, a place that Magic players got a glimpse of during the events of the previous set, Scourge, as a place that was at the time known as the Artificial Plane of Argentum. Not anymore. Featuring an artifact-heavy theme, Mirrodin not only introduces a new card frame to black-bordered magic, it also brings with it a new card subtype as well as a wholly new storyline. I did not see that coming! The story of Mirrodin can be experienced by reading Will McDermott's novel, The Moons of Mirrodin. And we do recommend you give it a read. It's not half bad. Oh really now? Regardless, here is our summary. It's about time. <laughs> Memnarch, the artificial being the Planeswalker Karn created from the Marari to protect his artificial plane, wanders around Argentum. To Karn's credit, the entire artificial world is perfect. Too perfect, in fact. And it annoys Memnarch. It finds itself fascinated by Blink Moths, the only thing on Argentum that Karn imported rather than creating himself, and gets inspired to bring more life forms over from other realms. Before Memnar can get to work on his newfound project, however, it notices an oily-like smudge. It wipes the substance away, but not before the mysterious oil infects the Guardian. <laughs> Causing an immediate change to Memnar, it decides to rename the planet Mirrodin after itself. Quite some time later, we find that the planet has changed quite a bit from the perfect, pristine world that Karn had created. Galissa, an elf warrior, questions the customs of her people, such as the rebuking ceremony in which the trolls of the Tangle help the elves forget their most painful memories. While most elves only get flares of their suppressed memories, Galissa has memories of a different world, one where organic life and metal are not fused into one. Seeing her as special, the trolls kidnap Galissa. As it turns out, however, this kidnapping is to save her life from the Levelers, giant and ruthless killing machines that come around every hundred years and wreak havoc on the Tangle. The trolls tell Glissa that she has a destiny, and it is because of this that they cannot let the Levelers kill her. Rather than being gracious, however, Glissa is angered that the trolls are more than happy to let the Levelers kill all those without this supposed destiny. She steals a sword from the trolls and escapes. Though it's all for naught, she is too late. Her family slain, she tries to fight off the few remaining levelers, when suddenly, the giant mechanical horrors simply stop fighting and begin to move out of the area. Injured, she's dragged along with them, only to see a four-armed silhouette before blacking out. She awakens in a cave, the deactivated levelers dormant all around her. Shortly thereafter, Glissa meets Slowbad, an outcast goblin who notices that the elf needs aid. He takes her to the Leonine city of Tajnar for healing, her wound now infected. Once they arrive, they find the city is under attack from the Nim, cyborg-like zombies that come from a decaying area known as the Mephidros. The pair manage to find their way into the city and, shortly thereafter, a Leonin seer informs Glissa that she will be involved with the end of the world. Despite this, Raksha, the Leonin leader, sides with the elf as he was also attacked by levelers and remembers seeing the same four-armed stranger. The Leonin seer then has a vision of the Mephidros. Raksha sends Slobad and the now healed Glissa there to investigate. The pair manage to make their way to the swamp-like region and after fighting off some of the native Nim, discover a golem submerged in the muck. After fishing it out, the Artificer Goblin cleans it up and reactivates it. Though speechless and lacking any sort of memory, the golem, whom they would later learn is known as Bosch, offers to join their party. Before they can leave the Mephidros, however, the trio are ambushed. A beast known as a Dross Harvester attacks. But thanks in part to the Golem's strength, they not only kill it, but they also capture the person controlling it. Now with the upper hand, they force their captive to take them to Geth, the leader of the Dross, who resides at a place known as the Vault of Whispers. They are attacked by a vampire which Geth keeps as a sort of pet, 
but are able to dispatch it before finally confronting Geth himself. Convincing the warlord that they could do the same to him as they did his vampire, Geth reveals that he was paid off with serum by a Videlkin, one of those four armed beings, to capture Glissa. The elf then takes a vial of the serum and the trio depart. As they do, Bosch says his first words since his rescue, Memnark. The three return to the city of Tajnar, but find it yet again under attack. Noting that it is not safe for them to stay, Glissa takes Slobad and Bosch back to the Tangle and to its Tree of Tales. Once there, she speaks with Shunt, the leader of the trolls, who tells her she is, quote, a nexus of great power. He also takes note of the vial of serum the elf now possesses, telling her that it can unlock the mysteries of the cosmos, but warns her of its corruptive nature and suggests she never make use of it. Shunt then begins to tell her about Memnark, but before he can say too much on the topic, he is fatally shot by a corrupted troll elder as to prevent him from saying anything more. With his dying breath, he informs Glissa that the world on which they live is, in fact, hollow. Chunt now deceased, Glissa chases down his killer. Just as she is gaining ground on him, however, a Videlkin appears and kills not just him, but also a nearby elf who was on guard duty. He was a close friend of Glissa's. Seeing this, Glissa freaks out. She unleashes a blast of magic that destroys the Videlkin before passing out. She awakens a while later, Slobad having taken her to a supposedly safe place, the lair of the Krark clan goblins. He informs her that the Krark believed the world to be hollow, just as the slain troll leader, Shant, had mentioned upon his death. Almost immediately after, the lair is attacked by a group of other goblins, the rest of the species on the plane, who consider the Krark clan to be heretics due to their belief. Slobad and Glissa escape, but the golem, Bosch, is captured. He and the Krarks are taken prisoner and brought to the Great Furnace to be thrown into its molten interior. Glissa and Slobad catch up and, after some fighting, manage to save their golem friend and the captured Krarks from certain doom. It's right after this that the trio discover the Red Lacuna, a giant hole that appears to lead into the center of the world. Glissa and company take the rescued Krarks to Slobad's hideout inside of the Leveler's cave for their own safety then depart off to the Quicksilver Sea, intent on somehow getting to the Pool of Knowledge at the center of the area's seat, a location known as Lumengrid, so that they may get the answers to the many questions they now have about their own world. After some struggle and harrowing encounters, the group arrive at Lumengrid. Shortly after their arrival, however, Glissa is captured by Pontifex, one of the most respected of the Videlkin researchers, with Bosch's help, however, Slobad, ever the inventive golem, manages to set off a series of explosions in the area, allowing the captured Glissa to turn the tables on a now distracted Pontifex. They force him to lead them to the Pool of Knowledge. Once there, the group is ambushed by a Videlkin known as Janus, the very same Videlkin who have been trying to slay Glissa since the beginning. In the battle, Pontifex is thrown into the pool, and Janus eventually gets the upper hand. As he's about to finish the elf off, Glissa has another mysterious outburst of magical power. Suddenly defeated, Janus confesses he has been trying to kill Glissa to protect the Videlkin way of life. He tells her that Memnark, whom the Videlkin revere as a god, will use her to destroy Mirrodin, and it is the Videlkin's duty, as the master race, to protect the world from threats posed from other races, Glissa's elven kind included. Pontifex emerges from the Pool of Knowledge, having learned some interesting truths, and witnesses Glissa land a killing blow on Janus. Having since learned that Janus was planning to use the elf to usurp Memnark's role as ruler of all of Mirrodin, the researcher attempts yet again to capture Glissa, with the intent of turning her over to Memnark himself. Bosch, however, comes to the rescue and knocks the wizened researcher out cold. As the crew looks to flee from Lumengrid, they happen upon another mysterious thing, the Blue Lacuna. Like the one they had discovered in the Great Furnace, this large hole also seems to lead into the hollow center of Mirrodin. Deciding they need to track down Nimnark to finally get the answers they seek, they venture into the planet's core. As they make their way down the Lacuna, Bosch speaks again, this time informing Glissa and Slobad that 
Thanks to the pool of knowledge, he now remembers everything. And while there is much more to the overall story of Mirrodin than just what was in the first book, there's even more to say about the set itself. Well, get on with it, muff Language. As mentioned earlier, Mirrodin is the first black-bordered magic set to employ the new card frames, though they officially debuted in the white-bordered set 8th edition a few months prior. In all honesty, initial reaction of these new frames was mixed. Some really like how sleek and clean they look. Others thought they lacked the personality and oldness of the original card frames. Either way, nearly everybody agreed on one thing. The new artifact frame just was not right. Yep. As stated in an October 2003 article on the Magic the Gathering website, the release of Mirrodin proved to Wizards R&D that a mistake had been made. These new light-colored card frames employed by the artifacts were simply too similar at a glance to the new light-colored frames used on white cards. While this mistake would repeat itself in the next set, Darksteel, Wizards of the Coast had enough time to darken the artifact frame for the block's final set, Fifth Dawn. And on the topic of artifacts, Mirrodin introduced the new equipment subtype. It was a new way to express items that are usable by the creature wielding them, but done in a way cleaner than before the subtype existed with cards like Zelion's Sword and Ashnod's Battle Gear, which played like normal artifacts and tapped to provide their equipment effect. Equipment took cues from aura enchantments, but in a fixed way that more or less solved the card disadvantage that auras sometimes provided players. During the design of Mirrodin, I did end up making equipment. Um, equipment, interestingly enough, started very innocently. Uh, the very first equipment essentially were just auras that happened to be artifacts. Like, um, they acted just like auras that you had, um, you, you paid generic mana for them, and they were artifacts that could be destroyed like artifacts, but you just you put them on creatures, much like you would do in Aura. They were very, almost identical to Auras, other than it was an artifact. Uh, and so we ended up making equipment such that you put it on the battlefield, you then equipped it to, so instead of enchanting it directly from your hand, you equip it to the creature. But then if the creature dies, the equipment doesn't go away, it just falls to the ground. And another of my creatures pick it up. Mirrodin also introduced three other new mechanics. Affinity which makes cards cheaper to cast by one generic mana for each permanent controlled by its caster of a certain type, such as Frogmite and Mirror Enforcer, having affinity for artifacts. Imprint, which allows you to exile a card from your hand and imprint its attributes onto an artifact. And Entwine, which appears on modal spells as an extra cost, allowing its caster to use both effects rather than having to choose between them. Both? Both. Mirrodin featured a wide variety of card cycles, 11 of them to be exact. This includes, among others, mana-producing mirrors, spell-inspired replica creatures, spell bombs, dual mana-producing talismans, and artifact lands. And it's that final mentioned cycle, the artifact lands, that really made a mess of things. In fact, they proved so powerful, thanks largely to the set's affinity mechanic, that they were all banned in Standard in March of 2005, as well as by default in Modern. They were also banned in Mirrodin Block Constructed Play. Turns out, A, that affinity was really strong, and B, artifact lands were essentially made affinity cards cost two less. Because A, they were artifacts, so affinity for artifacts, and B, they tapped for mana. And so it was very strong. Now the funny thing is, if affinity for artifacts hadn't happened, I think it might have been okay. Even without affinity, it was strong. There's lots of reasons why you want to count your artifacts or sack your artifacts or do stuff. Um, and the reason that we, we kept them in there, we talked about this, was there's a lot of fun things. You, if you're kind of playing honestly with them, there's a lot of fun things you can do. Um, and so it saddened me when we had to ban the artifact. In fact, we banned all six or six artifact lands. We banned them all. The card Disciple of the Vault, which had amazing synergy with artifacts and played very well with a card that would be printed in the next set called Arcbound Ravenger, would also be hit with the ban hammer in March of 2015. I'm banned! You're banned. <laughs> As for notable cards in Mirrodin that did not get banned, the set boasts a good number of them, no surprises that most of them are artifacts, of course. First, there's Mind Slaver, a key card in blue Tron decks, and a card for which new rules had to be created for how a player will control another player's turn. 
Chalice of the Void, a staple in Legacy Prison decks, Modern Tron decks, and others. The only legal in Legacy Vintage and Commander, Chrome Mox. The Black Lotus inspired Gilded Lotus. The Cannot Lose the Game, Platinum Angel. River Demon, lauded for its mass removal ability and strength as a finisher. And Chimney Imp, a 5 costed 1 2 with a woefully underwhelming ability. It's considered one of the worst creatures ever printed in the game. Sucks! Mirrodin also featured a number of reprints, and some of them are worth a mention, such as Atog, which debuted in Antiquities and had not seen print since 5th edition, Bottle Gnomes, which was first seen in Tempest, Brown Oaf, a card from Ice Age, which has an interesting interaction with artifacts, Icy Manipulator, a classic card from the game's original printing, the OG Zero Drop artifact creature Ornithopter, and Triskelion, which debuted in Antiquities but had not seen print since 4th edition. And we'd be remiss not to mention Solemn Silimacrum. The Sad Robot, as it's been nicknamed, is illustrated by Greg Staples and features the likeness of Jen Storen, winner of the 2002-2003 Magic the Gathering Invitational Tournament. The pre-release promo is Sword of Cauldra, which is part of a three-part mega cycle that spans the block's three sets. What's interesting about the card, though, is that it is not only the first non-creature card to be featured as a pre-release promo, it is also the first time that Wizards of the Coast put out a pre-release promo with alternate artwork, something that the company will continue to do from time to time still today. It was moderately well received. So is Mirrodin one of your favorite Magic the Gathering sets? If so, please let us know in the comments section here on YouTube. And be sure to subscribe to Magic Untapped and toss a buck in our tip jar on Patreon for more great Magic the Gathering content.